Greetings, tributes, and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. I hope that everyone is fine and dandy, and that you've all had a funky week wherever you are. Before we begin, I would like to thank the fabulous Andrew McLean for all the art that he has produced since the reclamation, and I would also like to thank my Patreons. Your financial pledge is much appreciated. I'd also like to mention the Hunger Games Discord, where you can take part in games that are written depending on the actions you take. Feel free to check out the link for that in the description, along with plenty of other links that are associated with this series. Now, without further ado, let's go. After a rather emotional reaping in Delphine Dubois' own District 11, she and her entourage made the journey to District 10, where they immediately felt the scorching heat that emanated over the district that day. As Delphine looked over the youths dressed in orange, she later stated that from where she was standing, they seemed to blend into the tangerine ground and honey skies. A brief speech was given, and Delphine subsequently chose a name from the female bowl. She called Mare Suzuki, who quickly rushed over and whispered this name into Delphine's ear, which she repeated as 18-year-old Chanina Linelli. Loud shouts broke out from the back of both enclosures, and it was clear that the camera was trying to catch both of these reactions, but it initially focused on the back of the female enclosure, where a woman with a dark tan and long, dark, frizzy hair was wailing frantically and cradling her head in her hands, whilst those around her tried to hold her up from falling to the ground. Eugenia Ravenstill noticed a ring on one of this woman's fingers, and she stated to her co-commentator, Enya Stalton, that Chanina must be married. As she was forcefully led to the aisle, the camera panned over to the back of the male enclosure, where a well-built young man with a shaved head was shouting whilst being held back by his peers, and as a peacekeeper in the aisle held his gun towards him, Eugenia said that this must be her husband. Chanina wept uncontrollably as she was dragged up the aisle, with Eugenia saying that at least she was wearing something nice for the occasion. Chanina looked ready to faint as she was walked onto the platform before shaking hands with Delphine, who seemed rather morose and even mouthed sorry as she did so. Without any further delay, Delphine walked over to the male reaping bowl before closing her eyes, thrusting her hand inside, and then picking out a name from near the surface, which she announced to be 18-year-old Maverick Rodriguez. A sound of further uproar raged through the back of the male enclosure, and the young man that had shouted was now being held from falling by his peers. Yet the loudest sound was that of Chanina, who was now bawling uncontrollably, which in turn caused Delphine to start crying. Eugenia stated that Chanina and Maverick must be engaged, as they were wearing matching rings, but had different surnames, and as a stunned Maverick was pulled through the enclosure by peacekeepers, Enya stated that this was rather romantic. As Maverick made his way to the platform, the crowd were almost completely silent, but some of the men and women at the back of the enclosures were clearly shocked and saddened by the fact that two of their friends, who were indeed engaged to each other, were about to go into the games together. Delphine shook Maverick's hand and she started crying as she apologised to him, but Maverick did not utter a single word. He then tried to embrace Chanina, but she was clearly hysterical and hardly able to stand. Mesuzuki appeared in a rush to end the proceedings, and he dismissed the population of District 10 before escorting Delphine, Maverick and Chanina into the town hall behind them. Chanina's father was her only living relative who was able to see her. He told her that although he had never seen eye to eye with Maverick, he had no doubt that Maverick would do anything he could in order to keep her safe, and that she should stick to him throughout. Chanina cried when her father said that he was sorry this had happened, but as the peacekeeper came to end this meeting, Chanina embraced him, before bursting into tears once more as he was dragged into the corridor. Maverick's parents tried to console him about what had happened, but it soon became obvious that he was more upset about Chanina being reaped than he was about his own reaping. Maverick numbly asked why nobody had volunteered for Chanina, but it was clear that his parents did not have an answer to this question. The Avox present in the main carriage reported that when Maverick was brought in, Chanina ran towards him and cried uncontrollably as they embraced. Chanina then asked what they were going to do, and Maverick appeared perplexed, but stated that he would do everything in order to get her out of the arena alive, but this led to Chanina lamenting that she did not want Maverick to die, yet he shushed her and held her head to his shoulder, while stroking her hair and saying that he would die happily if he knew that she would live. After holding each other for a few seconds, a voice was suddenly heard behind them, saying, you'll only live if he's dead, and vice versa. 
The couple swung round to see their mentor, Michele Onassis, victor of the 54th Hunger Games, stood by the door and appearing to watch the scene with a cynical expression. They both remained speechless as Michele approached, saying that as they were together, she doubted they needed convincing about how important it was to work with each other. But just because they were boyfriend and girlfriend, it did not mean that the game maker would grant them any special treatment. She came to a stop just a meter in front of them, and bluntly said that the capital had made this mistake a long time ago, and that they would not make it again. The couple seemed confused, but Chanina quickly snapped at Michelle that they were engaged to be married, before putting out her hand and showing her shiny orange opal ring. Michelle peered closer, and appeared to admire the ring, before smiling and looking Chanina in the eye, then saying, Congratulations, now welcome to the Hunger Games, and removing any apparent joy from her face. Following this rather abrupt reality check, Michelle convinced the couple to sit down with her on the sofa, and she spoke to them about the upcoming week. As the gravity of this situation set in, Chanina grabbed on to Maverick's hand and he caressed hers as he held it, but Michelle quickly noticed, and curtly stated that they might want to think twice about the public displays of affection, as other tributes might target at least one of them, in order to provoke the other, or simply because they were jealous. Once it started to get dark, the tribute's dinner buffet was brought into the carriage. Whilst Michelle and Maverick each ate decent amounts, Chanina appeared less hungry, and only pecked at the food, which caused Michelle and Maverick to ask her to eat more, but this failed, with Chanina soon exiting the carriage in a flood of tears. Maverick got up to follow Chanina, and Michelle told him to sit, but when he refused, Michelle quickly pulled out a button from her pocket that could be used to summon peacekeepers. As Maverick stayed at the table, she entered the corridor and sat down with Chanina. For the next few minutes, Michelle made it at least seem like she was paying attention, as Chanina went into detail about the plans that they had for their wedding, before crying even more. Michelle then tried to convince her to have something else to eat, but Chanina refused, claiming that she was still not hungry. As the evening went on, both tributes appeared tired, and Michelle told Maverick to go to his carriage. He appeared dubious to follow this request, but Michelle said that she wanted to have a lady chat with Chanina. Maverick kissed Chanina and left, then Michelle sat down with her, before saying that she needed to keep her strength up. She snapped her fingers at the Avox present, who brought a plate of food from a heated oven in the corner of the room. Chanina once again said that she was not hungry, but Michelle interrupted this time, and reminded her that if Maverick died in the opening bloodbath, she would have to fight on her own. Chanina told Michelle to not say something like this, but she interrupted once again and said, If he dies, you need to be able to defend yourself. Tears formed in Chanina's eyes, but she begrudgingly ate some pork ribs. Michelle watched as she ate, before stating that she was lucky to have someone who wanted to defend her, although she quickly followed by saying that she did not need to worry, as she was not interested in trying to steal Maverick, which made Chanina grin, and Michelle continued that his hair was too short for her liking, and Chanina actually let out a small laugh. Michelle proceeded to ask why so many of District 10's population, including the women, shaved their heads for the recent reapings, with Chanina replying that this was due to the heat, although Michelle asked why someone would not wear a nice hat instead of looking like a hairless calf. Half an hour later, Chanina had finished her plate of food, and despite still appearing sullen, she was not constantly crying like she had been earlier that day. Michelle said that it was time for them to get some sleep, and the ladies made their way down the corridor to their respective carriages. However, just as Chanina looked ready to enter Maverick's carriage, Michelle stopped her and said that they needed to sleep in their own carriages. Chanina looked ready to protest, but Michelle quickly pulled out the button from her pocket. Chanina glared back at Michelle, but after a brief standoff, she swore in frustration and entered the next carriage, which belonged to her. Michelle then summoned a peacekeeper and told him to stand there all night to stop her tributes from exiting their rooms. During the mid-morning of the next day, the train arrived in Snow Station. After Michelle double-checked their outfits, both Maverick and Chanina looked presentable for the capital crowds that awaited. Once they had disembarked from the train, Chanina unfortunately seemed quite unwilling to be greeted, and as she was asked to be in more and more photos with Maverick, tears started to form in her eyes, whilst Maverick was heard to whisper to her not to look so sad, even though he seemed to be doing all he could to not break down himself. After a slightly shorter time than usual, Michelle announced to the crowds that they would be moving on, and she quickly escorted her tributes to their car at the front of the station. Once they were inside, Chanina burst into tears again, and Maverick held her against him. Michelle looked disheartened, but nevertheless congratulated the pair on keeping it together. 
The group were subsequently led to their apartment, and Michelle gave her tributes a brief tour of their bedrooms and main rooms, reminding them that there were two bedrooms for a reason, before giving a knowing look to Chanina. They then re-entered the main room, and Michelle rang for the pair's stylist, Ariadne Flynn. Ariadne quickly took measurements for the pair, whilst Michelle told them about the importance of the parade the next day, but during this time, Chanina was not paying attention. When Michelle and Maverick were distracted by sounds in the apartment below, Ariadne was heard whispering to Chanina that she had seen their reaping and heard about her engagement to Maverick. This made tears form in Chanina's eyes, but as they began to fall, Ariadne whispered, Es tut mir leid, into her ear, before wiping away one of her tears. Although Chanina clearly did not understand what had been said, Ariadne simply looked her in the eye and then walked back to Michelle, telling her that she had decided that Maverick and Chanina would wear a cow print dress and suit for the parade. The pair looked at each other in disbelief, but just as Michelle was saying that this would be their opportunity to make an impression on the capital, Chanina's eyes breezed over to the screen to see the reaping for District 4 that was beginning. As the group from District 10 all began to pay attention, Delphine Dubois thrust her hand deep into the female reaping bowl, before picking out a name and reading it to be 17-year-old Sandy Selick. The camera quickly found a young lady at the centre of a human crater, with a short bob of strawberry blonde hair and many freckles. She breathed out a resigned sigh, but without a struggle, walked to the aisle before being escorted by peacekeepers to the platform. Sandy caused some surprise to Capital viewers when she was seen to be wearing a blue jumpsuit instead of a dress that was traditionally worn by female tributes. Although it was clearly homemade, Eugenia said that there was something about this look, and as she tried to explain, Sandy shook hands with Delphine before standing quietly and seeming to breathe deeply as a male name was selected. Delphine, who looked like she was in a hurry to end this ceremony, picked a name at the top of the pile, which she announced to be 13-year-old Pasifo Chigwell. A few childish jeers erupted towards the front of the male enclosure, and a small boy with fair, messy hair was jostled by his peers, who slapped him on the back in a mocking form of encouragement. The peacekeepers quickly pointed their guns at this group, and the tomfoolery ceased. Pasifo was then pulled from the enclosure by a peacekeeper, but he pushed against this peacekeeper's arm, which led to him being given a black eye from the barrel of the gun, amidst more laughter from the enclosure. Once Pasifo was on the platform, Delphine offered her hand, but he simply crossed his arms and refused to shake it, which led to a rather awkward moment as Mayor Washington waited so that he could end the ceremony. After a few seconds, a peacekeeper came over and nudged Pasifo with his gun, which prompted him to shake Delphine's hand. Mayor Washington then dismissed the citizens of District 4, whilst Pasifo, Sandy and Delphine were marched into the town hall. Sandy was subsequently visited by her parents and younger brother, Finos, who rattled off every piece of advice for the games that they appeared able to think of. Sandy told them that she would do all she could to come back, before joking that she was not that bad with a fishing rod. Finos said there might be water in the arena, and Sandy smiled, before embracing him and telling him that he could have her room as long as he looked after her fish. The peacekeepers then entered to remove Sandy's family, which caused her to hold her head in her hands and cry. As for Pasifo, he was only met by his mother, who rather coldly ordered him to behave himself and listen to his mentor. Pasifo began to cry, and she gave him a brief pat on the back before leaving abruptly. He and Sandy were then taken down to the train. Once the tributes were in the main carriage, Sandy nodded politely to Pasifo, and she let out a weak smile, but he quickly looked away. The train soon began moving through the fields beyond District 4, and as Sandy looked out the window, Pasifo gradually looked back in her direction. He proceeded to look her up and down, before asking why she was dressed like a boy. Sandy slowly turned around to Pasifo with a bemused grin, before asking why he thought this was the most important question to ask. Pasifo grinned sheepishly, and Sandy turned back towards the window. However, after a few minutes of watching the fields that were now turning into desert, she said that she would wear anything male or female as long as it suited her style. After a few seconds of silence, Sandy turned around, but she was surprised to see that Pasifo was no longer there. She quickly asked the Avox where he had gone, before awkwardly apologising when she realised that the Avox was not allowed to respond. Seconds later, Annie Crestor and Limerick Manx, victors of the 70th and 88th Hunger Games, walked into the carriage. They looked at Sandy with a puzzled expression, and Limerick asked where the female tribute was. Annie quickly nudged him, at an angle that she appeared to think that Sandy would not be able to see. Limerick then appeared to realise his error and apologised profusely to Sandy, but she simply grinned and said that it was not the first time she had been mistaken for a boy, 
before saying that if Limerick wanted to find the male tribute, he had left the carriage without her noticing. Limerick quickly signed to the A-box, who signed back, which prompted Limerick to head down the corridor towards the back of the train. Meanwhile, Annie introduced herself properly to Sandy, and began to explain the events of the following week. But within minutes, Sandy appeared to be in shock once more, and she began to shake slightly when Annie spoke about the training. However, Annie soon recognised Sandy's fear, and as tears formed in her eyes, Annie brought her a glass of water, which she sipped timidly, and Annie said that if it was any consolation, she knew how Sandy must be feeling. Yet Annie began to speak more about how Sandy could potentially identify an ally that might be able to help her within the arena, and by the time the dinner buffet was brought in, she appeared to be slightly less anxious. As for Pasifo, it was later seen through camera footage that he had made his way to the toilet at the back of the train, where he locked himself in. After checking all the carriages before the back of the train, Limerick appeared to realise that Pasifo was in this toilet, and he sat outside whilst trying to negotiate with him to come out. Unfortunately, this did not work, and after ten minutes, Limerick made his way back to the main carriage, where he helped himself to the bar whilst watching the reaping in District 3. Once the dinner buffet was brought in, Limerick joined Annie and Sandy at the dining table, and he explained to them what had happened, before sarcastically saying that this was going to be a fun year for him. As they ate, Annie continued to speak to Sandy about the coming days, and Limerick momentarily chimed in with relevant advice. Yet after a few minutes, Pasifo was marched into the carriage by peacekeepers, who claimed that he had jammed the lock on the toilet door and was trying to escape from a window, before throwing him to the floor by Limerick's chair. The peacekeepers left, and Limerick got out of his seat to help Pasifo to his feet, before explaining that he understood how scared he must be, but that he could not just run away. Yet just as Limerick finished his sentence, Pasifo spat in his face and turned to run. As Sandy gasped, Limerick quickly grabbed Pasifo by the shoulder, before pulling his arm behind his back and slamming him down onto the table. Limerick then growled to Pasifo that he could screw up his own chances all he wanted, but that this sort of behaviour could affect her chances as well, nodding to Sandy. Pasifo desperately tried to wriggle out of Limerick's grip, and it was clear that he was not listening, but Annie simply nodded at Limerick, who squeezed a nerve on Pasifo's neck, which rendered him unconscious, and within a few seconds he slipped off the table. Limerick poured himself a drink, and once he had finished it, he slung Pasifo's unconscious body over his shoulder, before laying him on a sofa in the corner. It soon became dark, and Annie decided to show Sandy the highlights of the 70th Hunger Games, which she had won 35 years prior. Sandy seemed intimidated by what she saw, and even Annie was clearly shaken when the earthquake began, which caused the infamous tsunami that wiped out most of her opponents that year. However, Annie proceeded to state that if this sort of event happened, it would play in Sandy and even Pasifo's favour, as many other tributes were either less able or unable to swim. Shortly after the highlights had ended, Sandy stated that she was tired and that she wanted to have a nap before arriving in the capital, which Annie happily agreed to. After Sandy left for her carriage, Limerick asked Annie what she thought her chances were, but Annie said that it was too early to tell, before asking the same question back to Limerick, who said that Pasifo would be lucky to make it to the games at all if he acts like this to the other tributes. Just over an hour later, Annie and Limerick awakened to their respective tributes when they were about to arrive at Snow Station. Sandy enthusiastically greeted the crowds, and although she yawned a few times from exhaustion, she jokingly explained that she was not bored, but simply exhausted, and the crowd seemed to understand. Several people also admired her outfit, and Annie was seen to look on proudly as Sandy graciously accepted the compliment. As for Pasifo, it was unknown how Limerick had briefed him for this greeting, but he actually seemed rather pleased to be in many pictures with capital citizens, although upon the publishing of these pictures, it was noticed that he was sarcastically smiling at many. However, Annie and Limerick managed to take their mentees to the car for the accommodation building without any further incidents, and within ten minutes, they had arrived in their apartment. The group was soon greeted by their stylist, Mario Price, who claimed that he was very excited to be designing for District 4 for the first time, although Pasifo did not seem to share his excitement. Mario quickly took the tribute's vital measurements, while showing a collection of potential designs on the apartment screen to Annie and Limerick. Yet just as they appeared ready to select an outfit based on marine couture, Pasifo loudly stated that he was not wearing that before storming off to the balcony. Limerick apologised and began to explain what had happened on the train, but Mario said that he would speak to Pasifo and that Limerick did not need to explain. Mario calmly ordered his team to start placing faux starfishes on Sandy's torso, 
before heading to the balcony, and Annie praised Sandy for her conduct over this day. It was unknown what Mario said to Pasifo whilst they were on the balcony together, but when they came in a few minutes later, Pasifo seemed more cooperative, and he allowed Mario to retake his measurements. Shortly after this process had been completed, Annie and Limerick ordered their tributes to go to bed, so that they had enough energy for the next day. As the mentors sat down for a drink with Mario, Limerick asked him how he had managed to calm Pasifo down, to which he replied that Pasifo just needed to be listened to, and that he was a complicated young lad, to which Limerick nodded and replied that the latter half of that sentence was certainly true. The next evening, all tributes were taken to the avenue of the tributes for the parade. Michelle had allegedly snuck some whiskey into Chanina's drink prior to the parade, which made her slightly less agitated. Whilst Maverick's horns were being sharpened by Michelle, and Ariadne sprayed some final black spots onto Chanina's dress, Maverick watched as Cillian and Gwyneth, both from 14, walked past, towards their carriage at the back of the line. He asked if this pair were really born outside Panem, but before any of his entourage could answer, Gwyneth appeared to hear this question, before asking, what do you think, and wink at him as she passed his side of the chariot. Chanina noticed this, and Maverick placed his hands in the air, before proclaiming that he did not wink back, but Chanina laughed, and said that she did not say that he did, although Michelle curtly told them to focus, before ordering them onto the chariots. As for Sandy and Pasifo, they appeared slightly weighed down by the seaweed and starfishes that had been added to their outfits, and so Mario took off some pieces, whilst telling them to relax and enjoy themselves. Pasifo had been surprisingly well behaved the whole day, and Limerick mouthed thank you to Mario as he helped the pair up. The parade went well for most tributes, although Pylon and Della, both from three, along with their mentor, Gif Schneider, and their stylist, Jurgen Cardew, were rather embarrassed when the electrical lights on their outfits suddenly turned off just seconds into the parade. Sandy waved to the audience, and in return, many flowers were thrown towards her. Pasifo, on the other hand, ripped several starfish from his outfit, which he threw into the audience, and although some viewers appeared to duck or avoid them, many others desperately tried to catch them, with some even shouting his name in order for Pasifo to throw a starfish at them. As for Maverick and Chanina, they held their hands together, and the flowy black and white fabric raced through the wind behind them. Halfway through the parade, tears began to form in Chanina's eyes, but after noticing this, Maverick reached across and kissed her as their chariot raced onwards. This triggered cheers from the audience, but laughter soon ensued when the cowbells around their necks became tangled. Yet they simply held each other close without falling over, and the parade soon ended, which allowed them to quietly untangle these bells whilst President Gaul gave his speech. Later that evening, Michelle was clearly delighted that they had won Anderson Fashion's Best Dressed, and Ariadne Fling cried joyful tears, which Chanina said that she had deserved. Sandy and Pasifo's outfits were relatively well received, but they were partly critiqued for being too similar to those of the previous year for this district, which caused Limerick to stand up and shout at the television that this year's outfits were much better. The next morning the training began, and Maverick initially practiced with the spears. He managed to show a decent level of accuracy, although Linus from 2 soon joined, and his startling accuracy with these spears appeared to intimidate several other tributes, including Maverick. However, Maverick proceeded to the largest assault course, which he completed in a record time for this year, and he spent most of the next day there as well, whilst watching over Chanina when he could, and checking on her every hour. Chanina initially headed to the electric station, but after hearing Splendor from one tease Della and Pylon about their mishap during the parade, she appeared to want to avoid being Splendor's next target, and so she headed to the fabric station, where she met Gwyneth, who immediately apologised for Wink at Maverick, but when she admired Chanina's ring, this caused Chanina to begin crying, and Gwyneth tried to console her. For the rest of the training time, they seemed to be happy to keep a low profile in the station, and so they stayed there whilst talking about life in their districts. Pasifo started the training time in the survival station, where he almost managed to start a fire, but after seeing Venus from 2 and Hatchet from 7 fighting with swords in the adjacent station, this seemed to scare him and he quickly fled to the camouflage station. Once there, Pasifo suddenly broke down in tears before throwing around any paint that he could reach, which in turn decamouflaged Rocky from 6, who punched Pasifo to the ground. Both boys were subsequently tasered and separated for the rest of their training time, with Pasifo being sequestered in the rope station. As for Sandy, she appeared to become quickly intimidated by the weapons that were flying all around her, 
and she therefore spent most of her time by herself in the aquatic station, which appeared to calm her. Sandy also worried the peacekeepers by spending a lot of time under the water. At the start of the second day, Ennius Dalton approached Sandy and asked her why she did not practice any weaponry, but she politely replied that she would never be as good as the others, and so there was no point, which prompted Ennius to reply, it's your funeral, and walk away. The next evening was the assessment of the training scores, and there was allegedly much discussion between many tributes and their mentors as to what skills each of them should show the assessors. Pasifo was apparently very difficult, and dithered for so long that he almost ran out of time to show his skill. However, he simply tied a variety of knots together from rope, which he claimed could be used to create nets and strangle people, which scored him a meagre five. As for Sandy, she held her breath underwater for a record time of six minutes, which scored her a six. Whilst Annie and Limerick were not overly joyful about these scores, Limerick stated that they were good enough to avoid the bottom of the barrel. Maverick threw spears and managed to hit several targets with a fair degree of accuracy, which scored him a respectable eight. Chanina had been unsure of what skill to show, but she sewed together a variety of denim fabrics with enough thickness for them to form a kind of armour. She was later given a low score of four, and this clearly upset her, but Maverick told her that it did not matter, and even Michelli, who appeared to have developed a rather love-hate relationship with Maverick, said that he was right although they might not be able to rely on sponsors once in the arena. The top scorers of this year were Linus and Venus, both from 2, who each scored 11, whilst the lowest scorers were Acacia from 7 and Jonathan from 8, who only managed a score of 3. However, it was noted that many of the assessors strongly debated the usefulness of various skills that were shown this year, which indeed affected their assessment scores. The next evening were the interviews, and after the usual display of confidence from the career tributes, followed by the meek contrast in attitudes from Pylon and Della, it was time for Sandy's interview. At her request, she wore a dark blue jacket and tie on a white shirt, along with a dark blue skirt that flowed along the floor. This surprising choice of outfit immediately caused cheers from the audience, and even Eugenia jokingly told Sandy to hand over this outfit. Her interview went by relatively well, although she appeared nervous and tongue-tied at certain points. Yet towards the end, Eugenia asked if there was a boy or girl at home, to which Sandy replied that there had been a boy until recently, but no longer. This admission of heterosexuality clearly surprised the audience, but Sandy quickly turned to them and assured them, there's been girls as well, don't be too shocked, which triggered a lot of laughter. Pasifo was dressed in a plain blue suit and his interview did not go as well. He also spent a lot of time staring at Eugenia's cleavage, which prompted her to say that her eyes are up here, whilst lifting Pasifo's chin with her hand. He even worsened the situation by saying that he enjoyed the training until he met Enya Stalton, who he said had ugly hair. Some of the audience laughed, and although Eugenia clearly tried to remain serious, she jokingly reminded Pasifo that Enya was friends with game maker Fling. Over the next few interviews, Brian from 5 and Carolina from 6 made rather personal digs at each other, due to an argument that they had had during training, involving a stray tyre that was thrown from the transport station. Mink from 8 came out in a brilliant outfit made of luminous fur, but apparently due to her nerves, she ended up vomiting halfway through the interview, which not only ruined her outfit, but caused Eugenia to have her dismissed from the stage, and an advertising break was quickly called. After a dull pair of interviews from the District 9 tributes, it was Chanina's turn, and she was dressed in a dazzling dress of warm mahogany colours. She was clearly quite emotional, and not long into the interview, Eugenia asked Chanina what she liked most about Maverick, and it was then that the tears began to fall from her eyes. However, Chanina quickly pulled herself together, and stated that Maverick was her rock, and that they were always there for each other. She recanted that shortly after they met, she had been badly injured in a horse riding accident, and that her mother had died days later, but that Maverick had supported her throughout. This triggered sympathetic sounds from the audience, and Chanina quickly added that she thought he was kind of hunky as well, which mustered laughter. The next interview was at a Maverick, and he was thought by many to look extremely attractive in his dark orange suit and tie. Before he had even sat down, Eugenia said that Chanina was right to say he looked hunky, before waving to her in the stands above, and jokingly telling her not to worry. Eugenia then asked a similar line of questions to Maverick, and he stated that when he first saw Chanina riding towards him on a horse, he believed her to be the most beautiful woman that he had ever seen. He then said that he was jealous of Chanina's horse, which mustered laughter from the audience. 
However, Eugenia followed this question by asking what Maverick would do if he and Shanina were the last two tributes alive, but he replied that he did not want to think about this and refused to answer. After Eugenia spent most of Cillian's interview gushing over his accent, it was time for that of game maker Artulia Fling. Eugenia was only able to prize from her the information that this arena was unusual, yet also full of hidden opportunities, which garnered interested sounds from the crowd. She also said that this was one of those years where she had no clue who would win. Once the tributes were back in their apartments, Annie praised Sandy on her strong interview and allowed her to have some capital cake. However, after Pasifo's comments towards Ennius Dalton, Limerick was allegedly furious with him, and he shouted that this could cost both him and Sandy in the arena. Meanwhile, on the 10th floor, Maverick and Chanina asked Michelle if they could spend this final night in the same bedroom, but she instantly refused, before telling them to wait for the arena, and then grinning as she said that this was what she did. Michelle then winked, and as she turned around to ask the peacekeeper to stand guard between their rooms that night, Maverick jokingly shot a disgusted look at Chanina. The next morning, tributes were taken to their holding rooms where they were dressed in a simple black t-shirt, trousers and boots, along with a jacket of their district colour. Limerick simply shook Pasifo's hand and told him not to be an idiot before leaving the room, even though the tube call had not yet sounded. Annie became surprisingly emotional about leaving Sandy, but she told her to not be scared of the career tributes and to aim for higher ground or any kind of water. Michelle saw off Maverick, and she said that whilst he had a strong chance, he should not die to defend Chanina, as even she would want him to survive if she died. Chanina was seen off by Ariadne, who told her that she was lucky to have such a strong man, and that she should work with him as much as she could. The tube call then sounded, and the tributes entered their tubes, which subsequently rose into the arena. This year's games took place in an abandoned port. Game Maker Fling was indeed correct to describe her choice for this year's arena as unusual. Despite being approximately the same size as last year's smaller rainforest, the shape of this arena was rectangular instead of the usual circular shape. An enormous stretch of water lay on the eastern side of the arena, with various jetties, cranes and even large ships jutting out into the water. Although many of these installations may have appeared pristine and functioning from the outside, they were mainly rusty, broken and defunct on the inside. To the west of the shore was a dirty stone terrain that contained hardly anything except for piles of fish bones, old fishing ropes and hollow wooden crates. However, as one travelled west, the stone ground would morph into uneven mounds of solid mud. The podiums formed a semicircle of approximately 50 metres in radius around a small cornucopia which lay at the end of a small platform that extended into the water, within the middle of the fleet of the ships. Between the podiums and the cornucopia lay the usual supplies of bread, cheese, fruit and water bottles, whilst in the cornucopia itself were many more valuable supplies, such as sleeping bags, ropes and even night vision goggles, along with a grand plethora of weapons that shone with a tempting glimmer when the sunlight caught them. As the podiums raised, many tributes seemed dazed by the sunlight, but as their eyes adjusted, they also seemed perplexed as to what kind of arena this was, and the countdown soon began. Sandy, from four, was placed on a podium that lay just to the right of centre. Once she appeared to have realised that this was an aquatic arena, she seemed slightly relieved, but also in two minds as to whether she should even approach the supplies, especially when she spotted Linus from two, grinning at her from the podium to her right. Pasifo, from four, stood on the other side of Linus, but even though he too was being smiled at in a menacing manner, he ignored this and simply focused on the weapons that lay ahead of him inside the cornucopia. Maverick from 10 was placed on a far left podium between Splendor from 1 and Carolina from 6. Once his eyes adjusted and the countdown began, he did not look ahead, but instead along the line of podiums until he spotted Chanina from 10, just a few podiums to his right, between Pylon from 3 and Mink from 8. Although Chinina was clearly terrified and looking like she was about to faint, Maverick maintained eye contact with her until only five seconds remained of the countdown. The gong subsequently sounded, and a total of seven tributes sprinted away from the cornucopia, with Ennius immediately branding them cowards. But Eugenia replied to him that the last two winners had also run away when the gong sounded. Sandy ran quickly, but whilst eyeing Linus, she appeared to slow down so that he could run ahead. 
As the first kills began inside the cornucopia, she managed to grab a bottle of water that lay close to her podium. She then spotted a block of cheese that lay roughly 10 meters in front of her, but as she began to run towards it, the girl from five ran ahead and picked it up instead, before coughing out blood and falling to the floor. Sandy halted in her tracks and looked ahead to see that Venus from two had thrown this knife, but just as she appeared ready to throw another knife at Sandy, she was suddenly distracted by Maverick, who had skewered the boy from nine to the floor with a spear, which sprayed blood towards her. As Venus prepared to defend herself from Maverick, Sandy seized her opportunity and grabbed the block of cheese, before turning and colliding with Chanina. Sandy even muttered sorry as she got up, before running away. Meanwhile, on Linus's other side, Pasifo was one of the ten tributes that had run straight towards the cornucopia, without apparently bothering to even examine the other supplies. He was one of the last of this group to enter the cornucopia, but he ran straight past Splendor, who was stabbing the boy from 12 against a wall. Then he darted past more weapons that lay alongside other fighting tributes, until he reached the back wall, where he snatched a sword and grinned as he turned. However, as Linus finished stabbing the boy from 11, he looked up to see Pasifo running towards him with a sword. He threw a knife straight at Pasifo's heart, which caused him to drop the sword and collapse to his knees. Linus then marched out of the cornucopia, whilst appearing to look for more potential targets. As for Maverick, he had run straight towards the cornucopia, whilst Chanina only sorted to a loaf of bread that lay near to her podium. As she snatched it up, she looked ahead to see Maverick entering the cornucopia just behind Splendor. Chanina winced as Splendor threw a knife towards Maverick, but fortunately for him, he spotted Splendor about to throw it, which allowed him to duck, and it hit the girl from 12 instead, who was running up behind him. Splendor was suddenly distracted when she saw her district partner to her right, being attacked with an axe by Hatchet from Seven, and so Maverick ran to the wall behind her and grabbed a double-ended spear, but just as he was pulling it from the wall, the boy from Nine pulled on the other end. The pair looked into each other's eyes for a split second, but the boy from Nine suddenly jabbed the spear towards Maverick, which pierced his left pectoral muscle. However, Maverick jabbed the other end of the spear straight back, with much more force, which impaled his opponent's neck, and he fell backwards. Chanina was still just about able to see what was going on through her hands that she was holding to her face, and she shouted at Maverick to get out of there. She then frantically ran towards a bottle of water that lay to her right, but collided with Sandy as she did so. Maverick appeared to think that Sandy may have just stabbed Chanina, and so he sprinted out of the cornucopia and towards her, but she soon got up, whilst holding the supplies that she had taken, and the couple ran west, away from the water. As they ran down the dirty paths, Chanina was heard to scold Maverick for having risked taking the spear, but he argued back that he needed a weapon to defend them. After only running approximately 500 metres from the cornucopia, Chanina noticed that Maverick was bleeding from his pectoral wound, and she said that she wanted to examine it, but he insisted that they ran further and find somewhere secure to hide, which she begrudgingly agreed to. Chanina suggested that they head northwest, which they proceeded to do, but after approximately 10 minutes of jumping over muddy trails and piles of fish bones, Chanina had clearly become tired. Maverick looked ahead to the west and spotted a large muddy hill that lay next to a stack of wooden crates, and he led her towards this spot. They then collapsed in exhaustion, and as they tried summoning the energy to get up, eight cannons sounded. Meanwhile, Sandy had run north after escaping the bloodbath. She did not look back and continued running past the ships and adjacently to the water. After ten minutes, Sandy finally came to a standstill by one of the smallest boats that lay near to the longer northern jetty, and as she tried to catch her breath, eight cannons sounded. This sound appeared to panic Sandy to some degree, and she looked back to the south to spot Venus and Linus walking in the distance. She quickly inspected her water bottle and block of cheese, before hiding the latter between two nearby crates, and placing the water bottle into her jacket, then running straight into the sea. Sandy swam east for the next few minutes, until she was almost at an equal level with the end of the jetty. She then relaxed in the water and spread her limbs out, with Eugenia commenting that it looked like she was trying to emulate a starfish. Sandy closed her eyes and took deep breaths, whilst Ennia stated that you would never guess by looking at her that she was actually in a fight to the death. After almost half an hour, Sandy seemed to be slightly less panicked, and she was now quite a distance from any other tribute, most of whom had travelled to the west, away from the water. She then swam north towards the end of the jetty, before grabbing one of the poles that supported it in the water, and then looking around. Eugenia even stated that it would not be the worst strategy for Sandy to simply rest there for as long as she could, 
which she in fact proceeded to do for the next two hours, whilst watching the shore for any movement. As for Chanina and Maverick, they spent some of this time resting where they had collapsed. Chanina asked to look at Maverick's chest wound, and although he said that he felt fine, she ordered him to take off his t-shirt, so that she could inspect his wound, and he eventually complied with this request. Chanina then used a piece of nearby metal to rip off some of Maverick's t-shirt, before wrapping it over his wound as tightly as possible, and he jokingly pretended to be suffocating. Although Chanina did not appreciate this joke, the bleeding stopped, and Maverick thanked her, before saying that he loved her. Chanina smiled and said that she loved Maverick too, but he suddenly stood up and looked around, which made Chanina sharply whisper to him to get down, before someone saw him. Maverick appeared to ignore her, and he examined the crates, whilst reassuring Chanina that he could not see anyone in the distance. He then tried to break a crate apart with his spear, and this led Chanina to get up and practically tackle him to the ground. An argument ensued between the couple for almost half an hour, with Chanina asking Maverick if he wanted them to be seen, and hence killed, but Maverick argued back that he was trying to break some wood apart in order to give her a weapon. He angrily slammed his spear into a crate, and this broke off some wood that fell onto the ground, and he sat angrily with his back to her. Chanina apologised, and she subsequently grabbed some of the wood that had broken off, before saying that it was the most beautiful weapon that she had ever owned. Maverick grinned, and he looked around to see Chanina holding this piece of wood, before replying that it was probably the only weapon she had ever owned, which made her shrug and nod. Maverick then apologised for losing his temper, and he said that he was simply angry about them being in the games. Chanina listened, but she seemed keen to change the subject, which she did by asking if Maverick wanted some bread. For the next few hours, the pair ate, kept watch, and reminisced about their happiest moments together, but as it was beginning to get dark, this pleasant conversation was suddenly interrupted by another cannon. Sandy had remained at the end of the jetty, where she was holding onto one of the poles in the water, whilst being gently lifted up and down by the waves. She continued to watch the land closely, but as the evening set in, this became more difficult. However, just as Sandy looked like she was about to make a move, a cannon was suddenly heard, and when she spotted the hovercraft entering the arena, she was surprised to see it hovering over the sea, less than 300 metres to the south of her position. Yet as Sandy watched the body of the girl from Eleven being removed, her expression quickly changed from surprise to dread, when she appeared to notice a jellyfish attached to her body. Eugenia and Ennius had been commentating on the demise of this tribute, and after her cannon sounded, they confirmed that she had died from being stung several times by a smack of jellyfish, that had just been released from subterranean cages within the water. The stings then paralysed her, and she therefore drowned soon after. Sandy quickly pushed off from the end of the jetty towards the shore. As she rapidly swam through the sea, Eugenia and Ennius watched and noticed that the jellyfish were slowly making their way north, towards Sandy's location. She continued through the water, hardly stopping to take a breath. Unfortunately for her, the waves continued to push her towards the shore. Yet when Sandy was just a hundred metres from safety, the smack finally closed in on her. She had appeared to be relieved as she neared the shore, before suddenly screaming out in pain and thrashing around in the water. Ennius stated that she must have been stung, and the underwater cameras confirmed this to be true, but Eugenia quickly informed viewers that the jellyfish had been programmed to give each tribute only three stings in total, before leaving them alone. Sandy at first seemed to be drowning in the water, but she continued to keep afloat with all the strength in her left arm, which had not been stung. The crowds cheered her on as she desperately paddled her way towards the shore, but when she was almost halfway there, she appeared to run out of energy and sink within the water. Ennius said that it looked like Sandy's time was up, but as he finished his sentence, she suddenly emerged through the surface with a large splash, before continuing to lash her left arm forwards, and after a few long minutes, she was able to feel the floor of the water with her right foot. She then hopped her way forwards through the water, and after a few more minutes, she finally washed up on the shore. Sandy breathed out in exhaustion as she gripped onto a pile of dirty sand, to the sound of loud cheers and snow square. Yet she rested for only ten seconds at most, before using her left arm to pull off her left shoe and sock, then after much effort, her trousers as well. Ennius asked if this was a budget panatena scalene, as Eugenia watched in shock, but before Ennius could receive an answer, Sandy appeared to be urinating on her sock, while somehow managing to not flash the camera. Sandy then pulled her trousers back up, and initially placed the sock on her left knee, where she had been stung. Eugenia stated that this must be Sandy's way of curing her jellyfish stings, 
and that they would have to wait and see if it worked. After a minute, she moved the sock to her right hip, where she had also been stung. As the hour went by and the darkness of night set in, many viewers in Snow Square commended Sandy for her quick thinking, as the feeling appeared to come back all over her body, and once it was completely dark, she was able to stand up, before tentatively walking away from the sea. Sandy was indeed extremely fortunate, as approximately five minutes after she began to walk inwards, Splendor from One arrived on the beach where she had been recovering for the last hour. Sandy spent almost half an hour slowly making her way through the piles of old ropes, before eventually lying down and resting. After a few minutes, she was also delighted to be gifted with some fresh fish from sponsors, who had been rather impressed by her swimming and survival skills. Sandy thanked the sky and ate some of the fish, but before she could even finish, it was clear that she was exhausted, as she fell asleep within a pile of ropes. As for Chanina and Maverick, they soon became worried regarding their lack of water, but Maverick rather surprisingly ripped the button from his trouser waist before putting it in his mouth. He then suggested to Chanina that she did the same with hers, as it was a way to keep the saliva flowing around her mouth, which he and his fellow ranchers often did when they ran low on water in the desert, and Chanina reluctantly followed suit. Eventually, the couple seemed to forget about their thirst, and as the night set in, they checked their surroundings before creating a small wall of crates and lying down behind it, before becoming intimate with each other. Once this finished, the pair were amazed, yet elated, to be gifted with a bottle of water each, and they quickly finished one of these bottles between them before saving the other. Shortly after, Maverick agreed to keep watch over Chanina, and he ran his hands through her hair as she fell asleep. An hour later, Horn of Plenty played, and the portraits of the boy from one, Pasifo from four, the girl from five, both tributes from nine, both tributes from eleven, and both tributes from twelve were all shown, which left seventeen tributes remaining. Sandy was one of the first tributes to awaken the next morning, clearly feeling the second day effect as she painfully touched her sunburnt skin. She then heard screams in the distance, and she tried to pick up some rope, although it was clearly too heavy and hot for her. She grabbed her water and fish before creeping to her west, trying to spy where these screams were coming from. Yet just as Sandy began to look, a loud clicking sound rapidly approached her from behind. She turned around and breathed out in shock as a green crab of almost a metre in height came sidestepping towards her, with its sharp pincers smacking together as it sped up its movement. Sandy swore, before running to the side and narrowly managing to pass this enormous crab, whilst it tried manoeuvring towards her. As she proceeded to sprint away, the crab carried on behind her, and the clicking of its pincers intensified, which appeared to make Sandy breathe out in panic as she ran. After a minute, she was clearly beginning to run out of energy, with the crab still closely following her. However, she quickly spotted a crane to her right, which she ran towards as the crab mercilessly followed her, with Ennius mentioning that he wanted this crab as a pet. Yet after almost another minute, Sandy finally reached the crane, before climbing just high enough to avoid the crab's pincers. The crab impatiently smacked its pincers together beneath the crane for another minute as Sandy caught her breath, before turning itself and heading west. Once she had seen that the large crab was far enough from her, she tentatively climbed back down from the crane, before spotting a nearby stack of wooden crates, and after glancing around and checking that nobody could see her, she ran towards this stack, before piling some crates around in order to hide herself as she rested. Within a minute of Sandy hiding, Chanina began to hear screams, and she looked ready to awaken Maverick, who was still sleeping by her side within their own pile of crates. Yet when a cannon sounded, Maverick began to stir, and after another cannon sounded just seconds later, he jolted upright, and Chanina said that they needed to run. During this time, it was shown to viewers that these cannons belonged to Jonathan and then Mink, both from Eight, who had each been pincered through the heart by the giant crab. Although neither Maverick nor Chanina could know that they were in most danger on the ground, Chanina quickly suggested climbing on top of the wall of crates that they had created the night before. However, as Maverick helped her up, a scream was heard just a hundred metres away, and the pair jolted around to see Hatchet from Seven being pincered through the chest by the crab, who was now holding Hatchet's body against the floor. Game Maker Fling later admitted that maybe this mutt had worked too well, and she therefore deactivated it, before it could kill off any more tributes than it needed. As specks of wood began to blast through the air from the exhaust of the approaching hovercraft, Maverick shouted to Chanina that they needed to get away before the careers came to investigate. They therefore grabbed their supplies and ran west, 
whilst keeping down, presumably in the hopes that this would stop other tributes from seeing them, and after roughly half an hour, they had arrived at the western perimeter. After resting for a while, they heard another cannon, which was revealed to belong to Cillian from 14, when he was ambushed and speared by Splendor from 1. After hearing this cannon as well, Chanina quietly cried as she lay against a muddy hill. Although she said nothing to Maverick, he held her hand in his and reached over before wiping her tear away. He stared at her for a while and she asked why he was doing this, but he told her that every day she was with him she became more and more beautiful. Chanina let out a slight laugh, before replying to Maverick that this would not help either of them survive, and so he said that they should enjoy their time together, before running his hand over Chanina's chest, but she quickly shut down Maverick's advances, before saying that if they were still alive that night, they could become intimate then. No real change occurred to the tribute situations over the next few hours, except for Pylon and Della, both from three, and Rocky and Carolina, both from six, who came across each other whilst exploring one of the largest ships. Although a fight almost occurred, Della calmly pointed out that using their technological and transportational expertise, they could potentially find a way to use this ship to their advantage. After this alliance formed, Gamer Fling was quickly interviewed and she stated that each ship's onboard computer had been designed to be usable, whilst the motors were fixable. Yet shortly after this brief interview ended, Aeneas and Eugenia looked on in shock as the light in the arena suddenly vanished, leaving the tributes in complete darkness. Prior to this sudden blackout, Sandy had remained hidden in the pile of wooden crates where she was keeping watch for passing tributes. As the darkness suddenly set in, she was seen through the night vision cameras to jump slightly, before breathing slowly. However, after a few minutes of resting and then appearing to relax a little, she suddenly sat upright when she heard the voices of Venus and Linus, both from two, walking north towards her pile of crates. Sandy looked scared, even though this pair were not actually heading directly towards her location, but nevertheless, she started to get to her feet. However, as she got up, she knocked over another crate with her shoulder when Venus and Linus were just 20 meters away. Sandy winced as she heard Venus ask Linus if he could hear this noise, and they brandished their weapons as they approached her. Sandy darted her eyes around in a panic, before using all her strength to push over a stack of crates to the west of her position, before heading north. After hearing this racket, the careers ran towards the crates, but Sandy continued to the north. Venus shouted at Linus to get it, but within seconds the pair tripped over the pile of broken crates and shouted in pain as the jagged wood cut their skin. Sandy was clearly relieved to have escaped, and despite tripping occasionally over the next ten minutes, she managed to make her way northeast towards the beach, whilst Venus and Linus angrily continued west. Yet after a few minutes, Venus finally realised that she had managed to take a pair of night vision goggles from the cornucopia, and she mentioned this to Linus, who called her an idiot, which triggered a dispute between them, but they eventually agreed to take turns with these goggles. The pair continued west towards the perimeter, whilst looking through the goggles for any other tributes that they could find along the way, but with no success, despite a close run-in with Acacia from Seven. However, after almost two hours of continued darkness, Linus spotted Maverick and Chanina, who were sitting on the side of the hill, just 200 metres from him and Venus. Linus whispered to Venus that he could see the couple and he led her in their direction, but whilst they approached, Venus claimed that it was her turn to use the goggles, and another dispute soon began, at first quietly, but then loudly enough for Maverick and Chanina to hear them. When they were just 50 metres away, Maverick grabbed his spear, but just as he whispered to Chanina to get ready to run, a loud engine sounded in the distance, followed by the pumping of water. The feed on Capital TV quickly switched back to show that the tributes from Districts 3 and 6 had finally managed to reprogram the onboard computer and engines, which started the ship, that was now about to head forwards through the water. All tributes heard this loud sound, and even though it was dark, they also appeared able to see the lights of this ship starting to move from the shore. Meanwhile, at the other edge of the arena, Maverick and Chanina were as equally shocked as Linus and Venus, but Maverick used this distraction to grab Chanina by the hand, and they tried to run north, away from Venus and Linus, but they were quickly heard. As Linus was in possession of the night vision goggles, he ran straight towards the pair, before throwing a knife which hit Maverick in the leg. He shouted as he fell to the ground just metres from the perimeter, before grabbing his spear and waving it around in the dark towards Linus. Venus was loudly asking what was going on and brandished her knife, but Linus quickly jumped forward, before removing his knife from Maverick's leg, which he tried to thrust through his brain. 
Chanina shouted for him, before rather inexplicably running towards this fight with her water bottle at the ready, and then tripping over Linus. He stabbed the ground just metres from Chanina's neck, but this allowed Maverick to push him off with such force that his night vision goggles flew off his head and towards the perimeter. The goggles flew into the perimeter, which caused a bright spark of electricity, which temporarily allowed Venus to see what was happening, and the goggles bounced off to the ground. She threw a knife that almost hit Maverick, but it instead flew past him, before ricocheting off the perimeter and hitting Linus in the lower back. As Linus yelped in pain, Chanina shouted to Maverick that they needed to run, and she hoisted his arm over her shoulder whilst he held onto his spear and they limped away. Venus was about to go after them, but she sprinted back for the goggles first. However, Venus then realised, to her great anger, that the goggles were no longer working, due to the electric current that they had encountered from hitting the perimeter, and as Chanina helped Maverick limp away through the darkness, she argued with Linus about whose fault this was, before removing the knife from his back, and eventually agreeing to head back towards the water once more in search of other tributes. Approximately an hour later, the light returned to the arena, even though it was now the early evening. Sandy had remained on the shore by the jetty. Shortly after the light returned, she quickly located the block of cheese that she had hidden the day before, then headed to the entrance of the jetty. As for Chanina and Maverick, they had travelled to the southwestern corner of the arena, where Chanina was now tending to Maverick's leg wound by using scraps of her t-shirt. Yet a few hours later, once the darkness of night had entered the arena, three cannons were heard within a minute of each other. It was being shown to viewers during this time that a dramatic fight was occurring on board the ship, which resulted in the deaths of Della from three, and Rocky and Carolina, both from six, who had suddenly been attacked by Linus and Venus, both from two. When the sunlight had returned earlier, this pair managed to row a small boat towards this ship and climb one of its anchors before finding this group and waiting to kill them. Pylon from three had successfully escaped, although after jumping from a higher level of the ship, he had badly injured his left leg. After the shock of hearing three cannons in quick succession, Sandy approached the jesse and walked towards its end, presumably in an effort to put distance between herself and the other tributes. She appeared to relax as she made her way further towards the end of the structure, but just as she was about to walk the final 20 metres, a plank beneath her left foot suddenly gave way. Sandy shrieked and fell backwards, but fortunately for her, she did not fall through this hole. As she felt the wind fly up through the space, she heard the plank fall 10 metres into the water below. Sandy then looked ahead at the remaining 20 metres before the platform at the end of this jetty, and after looking at the planks behind her, she appeared to notice that those in the final stretch ahead of her looked older and were clearly in a rather poor state of repair. Sandy then appeared unsure of continuing to the end of the jetty, but she noticed that the planks by the railing on the extreme sides were still in a decent state of repair, and so she held onto the side railing and sidestepped the 20 metres to the end platform. When she was halfway across this weaker stretch of the jetty, a plank behind her suddenly broke and fell into the sea, but as the wind continued to whistle around her, she whispered to herself to not look down, until she finally reached the end platform, where she rested in exhaustion before eating the fish and some more of her cheese. As it got dark, Maverick's wounds seemed to improve, and he thanked Chanina for helping him, but she simply smiled and lay back down on the hill of solid mud. Maverick then stared at Chanina for a while, and it was clear that he was in deep thought. However, just as Ennius began a sentence, Maverick asked Chanina if she would marry him. Chanina looked up and grinned, before saying that she had already said yes, but as she looked down in sorrow, Maverick approached her and lifted her head up with his hand, then asked if she would become his wife that night. Chanina looked perplexed, but Maverick continued that even if they were only married for one night, it would still make him happy. She stared at Maverick for a few seconds, before bursting into tears and saying yes, then shuffling across the ground and kissing him. The feed on Capital TV quickly cut back to the studio, where Ennius appeared to be the most confused that he had ever been, whilst Eugenia began to cry, and said that if she had known, she would have worn her best hat for the occasion. Ennius then quickly researched how a marriage was performed in District 10, and many viewers were surprised by the simplicity of this ceremony, which he read to only involve saying six lines of vows in unison, whilst both parties have their hands tied together by an orange ribbon. Viewers in Snow Square launched into cheers as the couple got ready to perform their vows, and within a minute, sponsors had sent in an orange ribbon, a wedding ring, and even a small capital cake, 
which made Chanina giggle and let out some tears of joy as they landed on the ground nearby. A quick check was conducted by Eugenia as to where the other tributes were positioned, but the nearest was Gwyneth from 14, who was an entire kilometre to the east. Chanina and Maverick thanked these sponsors before picking up the ribbon and the ring. Maverick asked Chanina if she remembered the vows, and she said that she had known them since she was five. Just before Chanina was about to start saying them, Maverick said to her that he was sorry, as this was not the wedding that he had imagined for them, but Chanina interrupted, saying that she did not care, and that as long as he was there, this was all she needed. Maverick then tied the ribbon around their wrists, and over the next few minutes, the pair said their vows whilst occasionally looking around for other tributes, but fortunately for them, they saw none. As Maverick placed the ring on Chanina's finger, she laughed and smiled. They kissed and soon lost their balance before falling to the floor in a heap of joy, and applause was heard all over Snow Square. As they looked up at the stars, Maverick said that he had never loved Chanina more, and she replied that she would never stop loving him. Eugenia, who was still in tears, then suggested that they leave the newlyweds in peace, and the cameras switched to other tributes. Sandy cautiously slept at the end of the jetty, whilst Maverick watched over Chanina. Horn and Plenty played at midnight, and the portraits of Della from three, Rocky and Carolina, both from six, Hatchet from seven, Jonathan and Mink, both from eight, and Cillian from fourteen were all shown, which left only ten tributes remaining, Splendor from one, Linus and Venus, both from two, Pylon from three, Sandy from four, Brian from five, Acacia from seven, Maverick and Shanina, both from ten, and Gwyneth from fourteen. Once the sun had fully risen, Chanina awoke Maverick, and for the next two hours they rested in the same location, whilst drinking their water and eating some of their capital cake. Chanina joked that this was probably one of the most unusual honeymoons that anyone could imagine, but Maverick said that it was better than nothing. Chanina smiled, and a second later, a knife suddenly hit the side of her right leg. She shouted in pain, and Maverick jolted around with his spear at the ready, before spotting Splendor, who had just come out from behind a nearby hill to the north. As Chanina held her leg, Maverick got up with his spear in hand and ran towards Splendor, who readied her other knife. Splendor threw this knife, but Maverick dodged it, which led it to fly through the air behind him and land near Chanina. Maverick threw his spear, but it missed Splendor by mere inches, and she continued to run north along the perimeter. He appeared tempted to chase her, but as he heard the cries of Chanina behind him, he stopped running and appeared to choose caring for Chanina over chasing Splendor. Maverick quickly returned to Chanina, and after some discussion, he pulled out the knife, but fortunately for her, it had missed any major arteries, which allowed her to get up, although she appeared to be limping in pain as she tried to walk. Maverick told Chanina that Splendor had run north, but that she could return any minute, and so they should head east, away from their current location. Chanina initially disagreed, but then accepted. However, due to the pain in her leg, Maverick had to carry her on his back as they continued east down the southern edge of the arena. Meanwhile, Sandy was still resting at the end of the jetty. She often had to rub her hands together in order to warm herself from the cold winds that were continually flying through the holes on the nearby floor of the jetty, where the planks had fallen through. Yet she still seemed pleased to be far away from other tributes, and hence safe. For the next two hours, Maverick continued towards the water, with Chanina on his back. Fortunately for the pair, they did not encounter any other tributes, although Brian from Five spotted them as they walked past a pile of crates where he was hiding, but he rather wisely chose to not approach them. When the sun was at its highest point in the sky, the couple reached the shore and they decided to rest by a large harbour arm at the southeastern corner of the arena. Little did they know that during this time, Splendor had also walked east, but along the northern edge of the arena. She picked up a set of knives that she had previously hidden underneath a wooden crate, and at approximately the same time that Chanina and Maverick arrived at the southeastern corner, Splendor arrived at the northeastern corner, where she soon appeared to become interested in the jetty, upon which Sandy was resting at the end. Sandy had fallen asleep from apparent exhaustion, and she therefore had no way of knowing that she was being approached. When Splendor turned at the bend halfway down this jetty, and was able to see someone resting at the platform on the end, she appeared to become rather excited and quickened her pace, while Sandy continued to sleep unaware of the approaching danger, with many viewers in Snow Square shouting at her to wake up. Once Splendor was approximately only 50 metres from Sandy, she readied one of her knives and threw it towards her. The knife narrowly missed Sandy, 
landing in a plank just a foot in front of her face. As she awoke and it quickly dawned on her that someone had thrown this knife, Splenda hit her own head with her hand and muttered, too far, before nearing Sandy and readying her next knife. Sandy had now got to her feet and appeared to be trying to shield herself. Splenda then walked nearer to Sandy, but this also meant that she had neared the weaker area of the jetty. She playfully pretended to throw the knife, which made Sandy flinch several times before letting it fly, but Sandy threw herself to the ground, which allowed her to avoid the knife by a few inches. Splenda proceeded to breathe out in frustration and then marched nearer to Sandy, who watched the floor of the jetty very carefully, but she was ultimately disappointed when Splenda stopped approximately 25 metres from her position, just short of the weaker section of the floor. Splenda grinned in a menacing manner and once again pretended to throw her knife several times, but this time Sandy stood completely still and grinned straight back at her. Splenda then threw her knife and it so narrowly avoided Sandy that it ripped the side of her jacket as she threw herself towards the side wall. Sandy then watched the floor in front of Splenda very carefully as Splenda threw her backpack down in anger and shouted at Sandy that she had been trying to set a record but that it had just been ruined. Splenda then grabbed another knife and marched forwards. As she walked onto the weaker section of the jetty, the planks beneath her feet began creaking and she looked perplexed but when she realised the danger that she had just walked into, she suddenly ran backwards. However, the extra force of her running soon broke one of the planks beneath her, and she fell 10 metres from the jetty into the water below. Capital viewers watched in shock as Splenda re-emerged above the surface and shouted obscenities at Sandy, who now appeared relieved, but was listening intently to what was happening beneath her. Yet soon after Splenda started to thrash her way through the water and towards the shore, she suddenly screamed out in pain as she was stung by the smack of jellyfish. Splenda desperately screamed for Sandy's help, but her limbs soon became paralysed, and within a minute she was starting to drown, and her cannon soon sounded. Before the hovercraft had even collected Splenda's body, Sandy had gathered her supplies together, and was carefully making her way along the side of the unstable section of the jetty, before running along the rest of its length and back to the shore. She then headed to the south and rested within another pile of wooden crates, where she watched for other tributes. For the rest of the afternoon, most tributes remained in the same locations. Sandy spent most of the afternoon sleeping within the confines of her pile of crates, whilst Maverick continued to tend to Chanina's wounds, and she was soon able to apply some pressure onto her foot. In the early evening, Maverick noticed that the sky was beginning to darken, but just as Chanina was saying that they should stay where they were for the night, an extremely loud thudding sound was heard from the edge of the water on the eastern perimeter. Like every other tribute, Chanina and Maverick looked over to see what had caused this sound, but as they looked between the ships that lay in the water to their east, they saw a large wave beginning to form that mounted to the height of the largest ships and was now rolling straight towards them. As Maverick breathed out in shock at what he saw, Chanina let out a shrill shriek, but Maverick quickly grabbed her by the arms and hoisted her onto his back before running to the west as rapidly as he could whilst the wave approached. As for Sandy, she had awoken after the initial thud, and she too appeared petrified at the sight of the approaching wave. She began to run west, but when she saw the sheer height of the wave, she seemed to realise that she would not be able to outrun it. Sandy then looked around in desperation, before noticing one of the larger cranes that lay near her, by the edge of the water. She threw her supplies to the floor and sprinted towards this crane, while spotting Acacia from Seven, sprinting west out of the corner of her right eye. Sandy quickly reached the crane, and with the wave now halfway towards the shore, she began climbing, without stopping or looking down. Over the next 30 seconds, there were two instances where she slipped slightly, but she managed to hold on, and as she caught her breath, she saw that she had almost climbed to the height of the wave, and so she continued climbing. Meanwhile, Maverick was running with Chanina on his back, but her extra weight was indeed slowing him down. As Maverick ran, Chanina looked behind and saw the wave that was now swiftly approaching their location. She shouted over the sound of the wave that Maverick should put her down and run, but he then tripped on a rope and the couple collapsed to the ground together. Chanina cried as the wave began to crash against the ships behind them, and she shouted at Maverick to get up and go, but as he looked up to see the approaching wave, he simply gave a bittersweet smile before replying, Not without you. A second later, the cannon of Pylon sounded as he was submerged by water, and Acacia sprinted straight past the couple, desperately trying to run to safety. As Chanina began to shudder at the enormity of the wave, 
that was now sweeping across the land, Maverick placed his hands on the sides of her head and moved her gaze towards him. Maverick said to Chanina that he was sorry, but she said that she loved him as more tears fell from her eyes. The wave rolled to within 100 metres of them, and Chanina caressed the side of Maverick's face whilst giving him a loving smile. The couple then looked straight into each other's eyes without even blinking or averting their gaze from the events around them. With just seconds until the wave would reach them, Maverick closed his eyes and leaned forward to kiss Chanina, who reciprocated. They held each other close, and a few seconds later their cannons sounded in unison. The wave flowed past them, and subsequently sounded the cannon of Acacia. 300 metres to the northeast of where Maverick and Chanina had just died, Sandy was almost at the top of the crane, mere metres above the height that the wave had hit. When it passed, the crane shook considerably, and although Sandy let out some petrified squeals, she managed to hold on, although she was drenched by the water that sprayed up from the wave. As for Linus, Venus, Brian and Gwyneth, they had been far west enough to avoid the wave, which had covered almost half of the arena. After 30 minutes, the water began to recede, and almost an hour later, Sandy was just about able to see through the darkness of night that it was safe to descend from the crane. However, it was clear that any useful supplies or hiding places that were present within the eastern side of the arena had since been destroyed by the wave. After descending from the crane, Sandy practically collapsed to the ground, before managing to crawl around the base of the crane that she had just climbed. A few minutes later, she appeared extremely relieved to be sent a water bottle, loaf of bread, and even a sleeping bag by sponsors, who had once again been impressed by her intuition, and shortly after consuming some of the former two gifts, she curled up in her sleeping bag and lay next to the crane. As she was about to go to sleep, Horn of Plenty played in the sky, and the portraits of Splendor from one, Pylon from three, Acacia from seven, and Maverick and Chanina, both from ten, were all shown, which left only Linus and Venus, both from two, Sandy from four, Brian from five, and Gwyneth from fourteen, remaining. Like most of the other tributes, Sandy had trouble sleeping that night, and often jerked awake at the slightest sound. However, as the sun rose, she was startled awake by the voice of Game Maker Fling, when she congratulated the final five tributes for making it this far, before informing them that a feast would be held in the cornucopia in one hour, and that all tributes would be given something that they each needed. Sandy seemed pensive, but she then remained in the same position, whilst occasionally poking her head out from above the base of the crane, in order to see if any other tributes were visible in the distance. The hour went by, and Ryan remained in the western extremities of the arena, whilst Linus and Venus each made their way to the cornucopia, as did Gwyneth, who was now famished and hopeful for any food or water. Sandy was resting just north of the cornucopia, but as she looked to the south, she realised that it was now between two of the ships that had been pushed together from the wave, yet just minutes before the feast was due to begin, Sandy heard the voices of Venus and Linus in the distance, arguing about whose turn it was to hold their backpack. Sandy crouched behind the crane as she watched the pair hiding behind a pile of broken wood by one of the ships that lay next to the cornucopia, until the platform finally rose. Within seconds, viewers saw that Gwyneth had emerged from the water that lay next to the cornucopia, before grabbing the only feast bag and running west through the gap between the two ships. Unfortunately for Gwyneth, she was hit by one of Venus's knives just seconds after running into the open. Although Sandy could not see what was happening, she held her hands to her ears as she listened in horror, and within a minute, another cannon had sounded. Venus and Linus were rather annoyed to only find a bottle of water inside the single feast bag, which Venus nonchalantly threw over her shoulder as they travelled away from the cornucopia. Over the rest of the morning, Venus and Linus made their way back to the west of the arena, where they were convinced that both Brian and Sandy had been hiding, while Sandy remained by the base of the crane, occasionally looking out for any other tributes, while staying as quiet as she could. Yet just as the midday sun was at its highest point in the sky, the cannon of Brian sounded, after Venus and Linus finally managed to track him down and kill him in the northwest corner of the arena. At this point, Sandy appeared to realise that the showdown was imminent, and as she peered out from behind the base of the crane, she noticed that harsh winds were beginning to blow east. Appearing to panic about what was her best course of action, she once again gathered her supplies into her jacket, before climbing the crane. Meanwhile, Venus and Linus travelled east, and as they neared the cornucopia, Linus told Venus that he could see someone at the top of this crane, to which she replied that it was the tomboy from four. Sandy watched the pair of careers walk through the eastern side of the arena, 
and as they adjusted their direction to approach her, it became obvious to Sandy that they could see her, which prompted her to grip onto the top of the crane and to breathe calmly. The crowds in Snow Square were now cheering excitedly, with support appearing equally divided between the three finalists, whilst Ennius tried to predict what would happen during the final fight, which he stated would be between Linus and Venus. The pair readied their weapons before shouting at Sandy about how they were going to kill her, although she appeared to be muttering to herself and potentially trying to ignore their threats. They were about to climb the same side of the crane as Sandy, but Venus quickly suggested that they each climb adjacent sides, so that she could not escape, which Linus agreed to. The pair continued to climb after Sandy, who was desperately looking down for a way to escape. When she looked at the water to the east, it even appeared that she was tempted to jump. However, when Venus was approximately halfway to the top of the crane, she pulled a knife out of her jacket before calling Linus. Whilst continuing to climb, he glanced at Venus, and she threw her knife straight at his head. This saw Linus fall back from the crane, and a loud cracking sound was heard as the back of his head hit the ground. Venus then placed another knife between her teeth and continued to climb towards Sandy, who Eugenia stated was clearly trying to think of a way to save herself. When Venus was just five metres below Sandy's level, Venus took the knife from her mouth before telling Sandy that this was nothing personal and that she was born to win. However, as Venus continued climbing upwards with the knife clearly at the ready, Sandy watched intently and repositioned herself. She then breathed out calmly before releasing her grip on the side of the crane. Loud gasps were heard throughout Snow Square as Sandy fell through the air, before her feet smacked against the top of Venus's head, and Sandy threw her arms forward onto the nearest bar at this side of the crane. Venus had only seen Sandy falling at the final moment, and she had no time to react. The harsh impact of Sandy's feet against her head caused her to shout in pain as she lost her grip, before falling back through the air, screaming in terror until her spine hit the edge of the ground, which caused her to fall into the water, and as Sandy desperately tried to catch a foothold upon the side of the crane, a cannon sounded. Gamemaker Fling hastily announced that Sandy Selick of District 4 was the victor of the 93rd Hunger Games. It was noted by many that before this announcement had even ended, the hovercraft had already flown into the arena, where it was quickly heading towards Sandy, whose grip was weakening on the crane. Yet after a peacekeeper quickly dropped down a harness, he was able to secure his soul on Sandy, before carrying her into the hovercraft above, which then left the arena. After returning to the apartment in the accommodation quarters, Sandy was shocked to be told by Annie that she had not only become a capital favourite due to her wise fighting style and decision-making within the arena, but also for her androgynous style and looks that had even triggered emulative fashion trends within the capital. For Sandy's interview, she dressed in the iconic halves look, that was specially designed by Ava Berwick, victor of the 81st Hunger Games. On Sandy's left side, she presented long strawberry hair, an extravagant sapphire earring, and a marine blue dress, whilst her right side featured a short side-combed haircut with thin sapphire highlights, a marine blue jacket, and matching trousers. During Sandy's interview, she was praised for how calmly and decisively she fought, whilst avoiding any major conflict with other tributes, which allowed her to remain relatively unscathed throughout the games. She once again thanked her sponsors and capital viewers before saying that she was most glad about winning as it meant that she would be able to see her family once more, which triggered sympathetic sounds from the audience. Sandy returned to District 4 and was pleased to be reunited with her family, who were able to move into the victor's village, but her presence was often requested in the capital for various parties, fashion shows and cultural events. Although she returned to District 4 each year for the reapings, she lived most of her life experiencing the riches and joys of the capital, where she went on to marry her husband, Focus Snow.